The Proposal Presented by Elder Ken Richards Today's scripture reading is taken from Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law has dominion over a man as long as he liveth? For the woman which has an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, and not in the oldness of the letter. Proposal. And a proposal, as you already know, involves, what's the word? Typically, how, what context do we normally hear or use the word proposal? Marriage, marriage right? When we're in church, so we'll say marriage. Otherwise, it can be a business proposal, right? Or whatever. But marriage, because we're in church, we're not talking about business today, are we? No. All right, wonderful. I'm going to ask you to join me at this time as we have another word of prayer. Let us pray. Again. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, O oh God, for bringing us all here together this morning. You have brought us together to bless us, O oh God. It's truly, indeed, a blessing to know you and to recognize that you have invited us to enter into your rest today, to commune with you with closeness and intimacy, even within the context of the fellowship of the brethren. So we thank you for being here. We thank you for your myriads of holy angels who are also here worshiping with us. We thank you for your Holy Spirit whom you have promised to pour out upon us, O oh God. And so even now we open our hearts to receive from you. We open our minds to be impressed and inspired by your Holy Spirit to interpret and to give us understanding. We pray and we thank you in the blessed name of our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, I'm not much of a storyteller, but I feel to take the liberty of telling you a story today that I heard. I, I didn't know originally the story. But nevertheless, because it fits so, I, I guess it, it fits so appropriately and with the thought that I'm impressed to bring out that I, you know, today. Sally. Sally always wanted to get married. Anyone like that? <laughs> she had no grand aspirations or dreams of major accomplishments or accumulation of much wealth or fame or, you know, popularity or anything like that. Sally just wanted to grow up and just get married and raise a family. And that was all she aspired to. And so soon she turned 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, and one day, finally, Sally met, who should we say? Pablo? Or uh, John, let's use John today. One day Sally met John. And she was certain that John was Mr. Right. You know, she was certain that he was the one that she had been waiting for all her life. He was charming. He was respectful. He was courteous, kind, and a sense of humor and all, you know, the package. And after about six months of dizzying courtship, one day, guess what happened? John went down on one knee and said what to Sally? The most beautiful words that she had ever heard. Sally, will you marry me? 
And what do you think Sally said? Yes. That's kind of an understatement, don't you think? <laughs> of course! <laughs> uh, you know, and the wedding day came, everything was just perfect. And of course, you know, everything was just picture perfect. Of course, after the reception, they left and they went out on their honeymoon. And after the honeymoon, they went now settled into normal life. And the very first morning, after the honeymoon, they settled back into normal life. The very first morning, she awoke at exactly 5.30 a.m. with an eerie sense that someone was looking at her. And she jumped up and John was standing there. She focused her eyes, you know, that was John standing here. And he had a piece of paper in his hand. And, you know, just as she was about to say, yeah, good morning, honey, John says, you know, up, 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 up. It's wake up time. And with much zeal and enthusiasm, John says, look, we, it's wake up time. I have a piece of paper, so he handed her a piece of paper. And on this piece of paper, it was a list of all her duties planned out for her for the day. He wanted her to know exactly what to do. So a little bit stunned, and I think I have a copy of John's list with me. Not the original, I think Sally has the original somewhere. So she handed Sally a piece of paper, and basically, this is what a piece of paper said. This is John's list. 5.30 a.m., rise and shine. 6 a.m., we're gonna run through this quickly. Brief breakfast preparation, see attached menu. 6.30 a.m., awaken John with a kiss, and then turn the shower on for him. 6.45 a.m., Hand John towel as he steps out of the bath. 7 a.m. Serve breakfast. Oh, remember, you know, parentheses, uh, remember my fresh grapefruit juice. 7.15, breakfast cleanup. 7.30, meet husband at the door with appropriate jacket. In other words, make sure you check the weather. That will tell you what kind of jacket I might need, all right? Meet husband at the door with appropriate jacket. 8 o'clock, free time. How much free time? 8.15, house cleaning. 11 a.m., balance the checkbook. 12 o'clock, 12 o'clock, lunch time. And again, anything you want, in brackets, anything you would like, except for the marked items. You are not allowed to eat these, they are bad for you. 1 o'clock, Mondays at 1, take the car for service. Tuesdays at 1, you do dry cleaning and laundry. Wednesdays at 1, you do shopping. Thursdays, you rake the leaves out front. What? Friday, you wash the windows. CJ, you sound like she would be packing up and going back home at that moment, right? <laughs> Fridays, wash the windows and Sabbaths, nothing. Because these were Sabbath keepers. Sundays, clean the garage. 4 p.m. Every day, 4 p.m. Dinner preparation. 5 o'clock. Meet husband at the door with a smile and a kiss. 5.30, serve dinner. 5.45, clean up and wash dishes. 6 o'clock, free time. 6.50, set bath for husband. 7 p.m., hand towel to husband as he steps out of the bath. 8 o'clock, neck and back massage for husband. What? How many of the gentlemen here would like to be John? <laughs> and 9 p.m., lights out, pleasant dreams, sweetheart. Wow, it kind of wore me out just reading that list. And so Sally settled into this life of rigor and torture, a life in which she was emotionally detached from John and from what her idea of marriage ought to be. But nevertheless, she sought to make herself do it because she, well, she thought this was what it was supposed to be. But was she enjoying this? No. 
And she went on, and by the sheer power of will, she went on and on year after year, until after 10 years, John dropped dead one day. <laughs> Unknown causes. <laughs> after 10 years, but instead of grief, she even felt a little guilty. Instead of feeling grief, like people would normally do it, somebody dies, she felt somewhat relieved. And you wonder, why wouldn't she? I mean, who wouldn't? But she felt some relief, and you know, after everything was done and all that, she picked up her life, settled back into life, and, and started, began to live alone again. She was, at this point, totally disgusted with marriage, and wanted nothing ever to do with it again. In fact, she shunned the very thought of marriage like a plague. How would you blame her? No. No. By the way, just to break, just to break, break the, the, you know, the, right here, I want to ask a question. Are there tens of thousands of people all over the world who are actually disgusted with religion and want nothing to do with it? Yes. But we continue. Sally was disgusted with marriage. And she lived by herself. She said, that's it for me for about three or four years. And then guess what happened? One day she was walking in the park. And she was walking her little dog, you know, those little things that look like toys. And guess who she met this time? She met, let's call him Michael. Kind of like that. That's kind of like Christ, huh? She met Michael and walking his dog. And, you know, just struck up a little conversation. And, um... You know how that goes. She, they started talking, and strangely, she was a little, you know, she was, she felt comfortable talking with Michael. And so they struck up a friendship. And as time went by, they kept communicating, and they went for walks, and, and Sally realized that she was really growing to like Michael. And she fell in love with Michael. You know, women always say, I'll never do it again. She loved Michael. And um, after about another six months or eight months or whatever, one day Michael dropped to his knees. What do you think he said? Oh, marry, marry. Sally, will you marry me? No. And what do you think Sally said? Oh, no, I don't know. Absolutely not. But on second thought, she said, you know what? And yeah, I changed my mind. Yes, let's get married. She said, this has to be Mr. Wright. He was perfectly charming. He was the person. So she decided to take a shot. So they got married. The wedding came again. It was picture perfect again. And every day. And until the honeymoon came, they went from the honeymoon now, went home, settled down into life. And the very first morning, right after the honeymoon, exactly 5.30, as if maybe a sense of premonition or what, she jumped up out of bed and realized that John was standing there with a piece of paper in his hand. No? Oh, yeah, you gotta keep correcting me. Thank you, thank you. Michael, right? This is the new guy, right? With a piece of paper in his hand. And when she saw it, and he said, Sally, she jumped up and she grabbed it to the paper from him. She grabbed it from him, she ripped it in two, she threw it in the ground and she said, no way, I'm not putting up with this. <laughs> and John was taken, uh, Michael was taken aback. You know, he goes like, but Sally, why, my dear? He said, I was up for the last hour writing that poem for you. And I wanted to, while you were reading it, I wanted to prepare breakfast for you in bed. Oh. Wow, you're along with this, huh? Yes. And so, life went on, and life was beautiful. Life was everything that Sally wanted it to be and thought it should be. All her dreams were just coming through in terms of her idea of what marriage should be. And one day, after a few years of this, she was up there just rummaging through the attic. And she came upon a little box with a lot of little filled with paper. And as she saw it, she felt, hmm. It kind of brought back some memories to her, kind of chills to her. And she opened the box. I don't know what she, I guess, forgot to throw it away, but what was inside that box? All those lists of do's and don'ts that she were John's list from the previous marriage. And she picked up the list and she started going through them and reading down them. And she realized something interesting. All the very things, with a few exceptions, not cleaning the garage and doing this and cleaning the windows and all that kind of stuff, right? but with a few exceptions, all 
the things that were on the John's list she was doing for Micah without any list Amen. naturally spontaneously she was expressing her love in doing the very same things without a list Michael never gave her a list and so what the story you've heard just now brethren is not just about Sally it's not just about John or Michael it's not about Sally it's about you it's about me it's about us because every one of us is Sally and we are in one or the other of these marriages. The story is about, is about two very different types of experiences. Spiritual experiences. Two very different types of relationships with God. And all the drama that we heard all about this, it, that we just heard, is built upon a foundation, a little caveat that the Apostle Paul gives us in the seventh, seventh chapter of the book of Romans as we turn to our, our theme scripture. The Apostle Paul begins by saying, let me just give you a minute or a few seconds to get there. Romans chapter 7 from verse 1. The Apostle Paul begins by saying, do you not know, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. How that the law has dominion over a man as long as he liveth. So the apostle is speaking to who? People who see themselves as the repositories of the law. People who pride themselves as keepers of the law. So Paul said, do you not know? And he goes on in verse 2 to say, For the woman which has a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he lives. But if the husband is dead, she is loosed. In other words, she is released from the law of her husband. In other words, in that union, she is bound by the moral implications of the covenant of marriage. By religious and also by civil law. And in the event of the death of the first husband, she is now free to marry someone else, right? We get that so far, right? And verse 3, so then, if while her husband liveth, she married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband is dead, she is free from that law, so she would not be invited that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. So in other words, in that scenario, she would not be in violation of any moral or civil laws. Amen? Wherefore, my brethren, Paul is saying, this then means, my brethren, you also. The apostle is using something which is common in our physical and temporal lives, something within our social circumstances, an institution which God has given to us, and he's using it to extrapolate from it to our minds a spiritual principle. In verse 4 he says, This then means, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. That you should be what? Married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Amen. Notice, the apostle here brings to view two types of spiritual experiences. Two husbands, two spiritual marriages. Two different types of spiritual relationships and he's bringing with all of that the emotional and the psychological experiences that come with both. One involving the law, the law being used as the means to the relationship. While the other has the law being the result of the relationship. Because notice in the second marriage, she is bringing forth, the relationship is bringing forth what? Fruit. What is the law as the means of gaining and accessing and securing the relationship? And the other, the second marriage, is the law as the fruit, the result of having entered into the relationship. Are we together so far? 
apostle here is dealing with the spiritual and the, and the emotional nature of our relationship with God. You see, God invites us into a marriage, hasn't he? He invites us into a marriage relationship with Christ. And the scripture makes it clear that in order for us to enter into that kind of experience, we have to become dead to the law. What does he mean? First, unless this happens, he says, there is no real intimacy. There is no true relationship with God. Amen. So in the first marriage, we are married to the law. But to be married to Christ, as we saw there, verse 4, Amen. to be married to Christ, we have to become dead to the law, but what does that mean? Now, by the way, let me quickly say here, the apostle is not here saying that the law is dead, as many are quick to point out, right? That the law is no longer valid. That's not what the apostle is saying. He's not saying the law died. And we'll see that later there is a re-emergence of the law, even with the second husband. But it emerges in a very different way. In the new marriage, it is seen as a genuine manifestation which is based on a completely different motive. And the point being made here is that these two different husbands are symbolic of two different ways of attempting to relate to God. Notice who died. You, the scripture says, in verse 4, it says, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. It's not the law who died. Notice who died. The believer in Christ did, not the law. The believer becomes dead to the law, but how? How? You see, he goes on to say, by the body of Christ. So it is when one discerns all the implications that are involved in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. When it becomes a personal understanding, a personal discernment, a receiving of it, the substance of it is received into the soul. It is that which brings them to the point of becoming dead to the law and entering into a new way of relating to God. Because prior to this, theirs was a checklist kind of religion. A religion of do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. And the do's and don'ts were done from a sense of duty. A sense of obligation, a sense of, well, God requires it, so I guess I'll just do this because I want to keep it as good graces. I will do and I will not do. I will observe the rules and regulations of the house that I may remain in favor with him. That's the first marriage. You know, in Colossians, Colossians chapter 2, reading from 20 to 23, the apostle says, Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ, from the rudiments of the world. Why as though living in the world are you subject to ordinances? Whatever we look at these ordinances, anything ethical or whatever, why are you still subject? Notice what he goes on to say, touch not, taste not, handle not, which are all to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship. Sally was functioning with John in her first marriage by a mere willpower, making herself doing it, going, going through the, the, the grueling day by day experience of making herself, working up the will, working up the, but was she in it emotionally? Was she doing it out of love? And that was what the Jews were doing too in their service to God. And the apostle says, we worship and humility, a show of, in other words, it's, and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. This is checklist religion. It is heathenism. In verse 5, the apostle goes on. He says, for when we were in the flesh, the motion, oh, we're back to Romans chapter 7. I made a quick switch there from Colossians, and I'm not sure if you follow. So we're back to our theme text in Romans chapter 7, verse 5. 
He said, for when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins which were by the law did work. In other words, they were working in our members to bring forth fruit unto what? Death. In other words, to be in that kind of a relationship with God in which we are functioning from a checklist sort of religion is to be still in the flesh. No matter how pious it looks or no matter how righteous it looks or we, we behave, Amen. the word of God cannot lie. And Paul says that in this state, he says, as long as we are living in the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members, in our bodies, to bear fruit unto death. So notice two kinds of fruit are being born. In verse 4, we saw, it says that we should bring forth, it says that you should be, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. That you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that you should bring forth fruit unto God. That is the second marriage, right? But the first marriage, which was the checklist sort of a marriage, notice it brought forth fruit unto what? Death. Unto death. And Paul says, the motions of sins which were by the law, in other words, Paul is saying, when we're in the flesh, he says, before we are truly converted, before we enter into the experience of knowing Christ, because going to church doesn't mean we know him. Going to church for 100 years doesn't mean we know him. Amen. Paul says, before we enter into this experience, the law actually stimulated more disobedience in us. Let me explain. Not that there's anything bad in the law. It is the response of the carnal nature to the prohibition. Even in a holy state, Eve herself was, her curiosity was stimulated even by a prohibition, right? Yes. Even in a holy state. And what Paul says, the motions which were of sins, which were by the law, you know, the apostle is saying, look, he tells us in Romans 6, Romans 8, by the way, 6 to 8, he says, the carnal mind is enmity against God because it is not what? Subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So as we said, even in sinless Eve, the prohibition stimulated a greater curiosity in him. When a prohibition, not compare that to even the fallen nature, when there is a forbidding or a prohibition imposed upon the fallen nature, it actually stimulates a greater desire to have the thing that is forbidden. Yes. Yes. Anybody is connected with that? Yes. Just tell your children, okay, I'm going to town to do some shopping, but I don't want you to look what's in that cupboard over there because I, there's something that I don't want you to see or that you must know about, mm -hmm. right? No, you could have said nothing and gone shopping and the kid wouldn't have cared. What do you think happens? That kid can't take the eyes off that cover. And there's something pulling them. I need to go. I, what is what I'm trying to say? And this is what Paul means when he says, emotions of sins which were by the flesh arose by the law. It means that the prohibition, the, put it this way, not the law did it, not the prohibition, not the prohibition do it, but the car and fallen nature actually uses the prohibition as the means by which it stimulates the desires to go against the prohibition itself. But when brought into this love relationship with this new husband, with Christ, the sinful desires which used to be activated, which used to be stimulated by the prohibition, actually lose their power of enticement over us. Are we together? And Experientially, this is in one sense what it means to become dead to the law. It doesn't have that appeal, appeal to you anymore. The desires of the flesh which would be aroused and stimulated by the prohibition are it no longer responds to it. It no longer has that enticement over you. You're, you're being you know, broken free from the bewitching magic by which it holds you. So in other words, that's what the Apostle Paul talks about, being dead to the law. He's talking about dying of something within. 
And what is it, what is it that enables this? What is, it, what is it that causes the prohibition to no longer invoke within us a desire to transgress it? Notice prior to this, coming into the new marriage, the very presence of the don't or the do, whatever, somehow stimulates something in the, in the fallen nature to go against it. But now, it no longer inflames the passions. And why? Because a new desire takes its place. Amen. We have become married to a new husband, even Christ. Amen. And he supersedes all contrary desires. He is, we're told in Haggai chapter 2 and verse 7, that he is the desire of all nations. And since there is therefore now, as we're told in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Since that is the case, we are therefore dead to the law, not just experientially, because it no longer the, 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 the desire to break it no longer appeals to us, no longer entices us as before as it did in the old marriage, it no longer has that power to entice us as when we're in the new marriage. So in that sense, it means that experientially we have become dead to it. And no, because there is no condemnation in the new husband, we are also not just experientially, but legally also dead to it. Because its condemnation no longer hovers over us. You know, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is within you. You see, brethren, the kingdom begins in the here and now. And it begins in the intimate relationship of the second husband, of knowing Jesus, knowing him as a friend, knowing him as Lord, knowing him as Savior, but knowing him as a friend and husband. In verse 6 of Romans chapter 7, the Apostle Paul says, But now we are delivered from the law that being dead, wherein we were held, that we should serve. So in other words, we still serve. Amen? Amen. But no, no, he says we should serve in newness of spirit. It's not just the externals now. It's not just making yourself do the right and to follow the list. It is coming from within now. We should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of John's list. Are we together? Amen. What we're seeing here is Sally before and after. First with John in the oldness of the letter in which this Strictures were imposed upon her and she had to go by day by day checking off, checking off, I do this, I do this, I do this to keep John happy. And the after we see Sally in a relationship of restfulness in which she doesn't have to seek to do for John in order to seek to maintain some friendship or, to, to, or, or, or some sense of security. Because with Michael, she, thank you, with Michael, she is secure. Amen. And in that kind of mental state, that which she would normally have to force to make herself do, she does naturally and spontaneously because it throws from a new motive from within, the motive of love. Amen. And that is the kind of relationship with God that the apostle is seeking to bring us to open our mind to understand that what God desires of us. You see, when we try to gain salvation from a checklist kind of religion, do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this, when that becomes the emphasis of our religion, we are actually using our obedience to the law as the basis for our relationship with God. And the apostle is saying this, notice what he, what he says, you know, he says in verse 5, when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin which were by the law did our work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. 
So what the apostle is saying is that when this becomes a reality, we become trapped into a cycle of sinning and repenting, sinning and repenting. And you'll, be, you'll find yourself making promises over and over again not to do it again. But very soon you'll find that your promises are ropes of sand. sand. And you cannot swing across a chasm on a rope of sand. You cannot climb up a mountain by pulling up on a rope of sand. You can't. And so with each failure, you end up accumulating more and more shame and guilt upon yourself in an endless cycle of sinning and repenting. And finally, what do you think thousands do every year? They just give up in frustration and say, this didn't work. And they leave church, they leave whatever it is they were, fellowship, wherever, and they just go back to the word. They said, it's, it's, it's an exercise in futility, it's frustration. Because they were engaging in will worship. While on the other hand, even in that in environment with the first husband also, while some just give up and go back into the world and say, forget church, forget God, this don't work. You find another group who in the same first marriage, they choose to stick it out by sheer willpower. And so they remain in churches for 20, 30, 40, 50 years in a loveless state of obedience to a checklist of do's and don'ts. While never ever having entered into real marriage with Jesus Christ. And quite, you find quite often they might be able to recite doctrines. But there is no marriage. And they know it because the heart makes you know it. The conscience makes you know it. It's a loveless formalism and intellectual experience of just going down the checklist and trying to do this and to do that, what it says, from a sense of duty, a sense of obligation. And by sheer willpower, many stick it out just because, well, I'm going to church, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, because he is coming one day and I want to make sure that if he were to show up, I'm safe. And I see that as paganism. Amen. So they say, well, I'm not taking any chances. I'm going to hang in there no matter what. No matter how much. There's a disconnect between what I am saying and what I'm doing and what my heart is really telling me. The heart is saying, there's a void. There's not a connection there. And so they think that by some luck or perseverance, they might get into the kingdom. But there is really no marriage. And for many, the Christian walk is merely a walk of quiet desperation. Maintaining right behavior, looking orderly, and doing the right things, and looking and acting Christianish. I'm making up a word here. In order to remain in God's good favor, seeking to earn and to maintain God's approval. Seeking to hear that, well done. And that get a pat on the shoulder. And nothing is wrong with wanting to hear that well done, you know. I want to hear that well done. Because Jesus himself says in the parable that when he returns, he will say to some, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. But how does one get to receive that kind of a commendation? By trying to conform to a checklist of right behaviors? Or by being in love with Jesus Christ? Understand, brethren, that by living by an external code of obedience, no matter how good it looks, we can never provide or produce genuine external obedience. With sufficient effort, with sufficient exercise of willpower, we can provide that which looks much like real obedience. But it's merely a clever counterfeit to obedience, no matter how good it looks. There are millions of people out of the world in churches, today and tomorrow, who are in this kind of an experience, still married to the old husband. It's a clever counterfeit. It may look like the real thing. We might even maintain that posture of outward compliance for many years, but our heart and our conscience tells us something is lacking. And the common tendency then is to quiet the conscience by what? Multiplying forms and rituals. 
to work of a kind of fervor or zeal for righteousness. There is, yes, there is such a thing as holy zeal, right? Yes. Amen. But zeal can also be a posture of behavior which merely gives evidence that the heart relationship is absent. You know that, right? Yes. Zeal can also be an evidence that the heart relationship is absent. The human mind is an amazing thing, Virgin, and, and the human mind is ingenious in its ability to hide from God. Yeah. As I said a few weeks ago, the most common and the most popular and the most ingenious place to hide from God, you know is where? In religion. Yes. But this would be no different from the zeal of the Pharisees in that Christ eventually was, that Christ was constantly in opposition against all through his ministry. The same zeal which eventually murdered him. You see, Sally, in the first marriage, as the marriage with John, she had to daily muster up an almost superhuman effort to comply with John's list. And the story says that one day John dropped dead of unknown causes, you know? You wonder. I wonder if Sally knows. <laughs> when those who were in that kind of an experience, they eventually killed the source of their discomfort, right? Maybe, maybe Sally had just come to the end of herself. But it's all just merely illustrative. To illustrate a spiritual principle, two kinds of attempts, two ways of attempting to relate to God, but only one works. I mean, think about this. What if you were to ask your spouse, honey, why do you cook such wonderful meals for me every day? Or why do you iron my shirt? Or why do you go on walks with me? Why do you massage my feet? Why do you get me a birthday gift? Why do you bring me flowers and all these things? What if you were to ask your spouse and they were to answer, well, I do these things for you because I'm married to you and I'm doing it from a sense of duty. I feel obligated to do it. Because the book of marriage says that this is what husbands are supposed to do or this is what wives are supposed to do. And besides, if I don't, you might leave me and I don't want you to leave me. What if that was the answer you got? Wouldn't you be satisfied with that kind of an answer? No. Why? Why would you not be satisfied with, with that kind of answer? Because the very nature that you are tells you that something is wrong with that. It goes contrary to the principles of genuinely relating, right? None of us would like that. Are we made in God's image? Were we made in God's image? Yes. Is that what God wants, therefore? No. Does God want our outward, our outward, our external compliance while rebellion is still in our hearts? That is what is offered to him under the old covenant paradigm of worship. That is what is offered to God when the law is seen as a list of requirements to be complied with. Under this kind of a mindset, under this kind of a framework, this kind of a paradigm, what God ends up getting is not genuine obedience, but mere formalism of outward compliance. That is merely role playing, you know, role playing. Under the new covenant relationship, the law is written where? In the heart. And that which flows out from the individual in terms of external obedience, it flows from where? It flows from the heart. And as it turns out, that is what God desires. That is what honors Him. And that is what we desire to do too. What we desire and what we do are one and the same with what God desires to see in us. We're told in Desire Ages, beautiful quotation, just kind of puts the cap on this thought. Page 
668, paragraph 3. It says, all, how much, how many, how much? All, all true obedience comes from the heart. Amen. It was heart work with Christ. And if we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims and so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will that when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out the impulses of our own heart. Amen. Praise God. Amen. It is the difference between night and day. These two experiences represented by these two types of marriage. You see, it makes all the difference in the world. It is the difference between living your Christian life under a sense of duty and obligation and making prominent within your Christianity the following of rules on the one hand and on the other hand being truly in love with God so that you naturally desire what God desires because the law now flows from the heart. Amen. Your values become aligned with his values because your heart has been bound together, it's been bonded, it has been knit together with his heart in the union of truly authentic, loving relationship. That's what God desires. Amen. That's what he wants. That's what we want in our marriages, right? And thus, as a result of that, we now serve him from our hearts, not because you have to, but because you want to. Amen. And you want to more than anything else. Your whole self, your whole being becomes invested in the process. It becomes a joy. It becomes a delight. You become unconscious even of your own obedience. Right. Sally, in the second marriage with Michael, she was even aware that she was doing these things until long after she came and she checked this. But she said, I'm doing the same things that John gave me on the checklist. She wasn't aware. It was spontaneous. It was just naturally flowing from a heart of love. That is what love does. Love creates within and flows out. Amen. So in this kind of a relationship with God, we become even unconscious of our own obedience because when there is a true bonding of hearts as in a genuine love relationship, obedience flows from within because it is love motivated. And thus you do it spontaneously and naturally. You are living from a whole new paradigm. And thus, as we saw in the Zara of Ages, when obeying God, you are not just checking off points on a list of rules. You are actually carrying out the impulses of your own heart. Because your heart, your desires, your impulses have become knit with his in the union of that love relationship. And what you desire and enjoy doing turns out that it's what God requires and enjoys to see in you. Amen. That is the difference between being married to John and being married to Michael. And those who came in afterwards probably have no clue what we're talking about. But love is its own motive, right? What if your spouse were to ask you, hey Vincent, what if your beautiful wife were to ask you, honey, why do you love me? I'm sure she's asked you that before, maybe. I wonder what you said. You know, love is its own motive. You might say, well, honey, I love you because you're beautiful. What do you trigger in your mind? Well, what if I were to lose my beauty? Maybe. You might say, honey, I love you because you are strong. Or because, well, what if I were to? Love has no reason. Love creates its own motive. That is what, who, and who God is. God didn't love us in order to get anything in return. God's love is absolutely non-self-centered. It's totally other centered God loves us because that's who, he, that's who he is. That is what he does. That is all he does. And it must be constantly flowing outwards from the center which is God out to all those who are sustained by that love. 
And even now, you know, within the hearing of my voice, there might be some saying, well, I'm going to fall in love with Jesus then, so I can be saved. Mm. But even that too is perverting the whole thing. Amen. Love does not have one particle of self-interest. Besides, you cannot will yourself to love anything or anybody, to, to feel affectionate to anyone or anybody. You can will yourself to do loving things. Right? Yes. We can will ourselves to do loving things, but the genuine experience, which involves not only the intellect and the will, but the emotions, the genuine experience only happens when hearts are knit together by love. Amen. And so too you will. You can will yourself to go through the motions of religion, but the heart still remains empty and unfulfilled. Because God has implanted within your heart the mustard seed of a desire to know Jesus Christ. Act upon that mustard seed. That you can do. And you can will to do that. But ask Him to increase your desire for Him. And immediately, you know what He does? He starts to reveal Himself more clearly to you. Because he knows that the only thing that can make you love him, you know the expression you see in bumper stickers, or used to see in bumper stickers, to know me is to love me. It's a lie unless it's in reference to God. So when God sees that true desire to know him coming from you, from the depths of your heart, what does he do? He does he supernaturally, bam, sap you with some love? No, he opens his heart and he says, this is who I am. He reveals himself more clearly to you and naturally love is awakened within you. Amen. Amen. Commit to spending more time with him as he opens your eyes. He's removing the blinders from you. Spend quality time. <laughs> when Sally met Michael, you think they spent quality time together? They spent time alone together? They went walking right together and you know, went out for lunch and they spent quality time talk, you know, chatting and talking and uh, just hanging you know, right? Commit to spending time. Stop looking at this as a checklist thing in our terms of our Christianity. See it as a relationship with Christ. Yeah. A, re a relationship that's founded upon the only thing on which relationships can truly be built and survive. Love. So commit to spending time with him as he opens, as he removes the blinders from your eyes, as he opens your eyes. And take regular walks with him. Take regular walks with him and he will reveal himself to you even through nature. We're not talking about pantheism here, the idea that he is in nature, no. But he, he uses nature as an instrument for the revelation of his love and his concern for you. The apostle tells us in Romans chapter 1 verse 20 that God uses nature to reveal himself so clearly to us that he leaves every man without excuse. So take walks with him. He will reveal himself to you through the poor, even through the downcast, the downtrodden. As you give yourself, as you give yourself in service to uplift and to encourage and to help others, you will find that the love of God is flowing through you. Lose yourself in the cares and concerns of the suffering ones. You know, it's Christ during his ministry. He was constantly among the downtrodden, the social outcasts, huh? uplifting, encouraging, strengthening, even those who were marginalized by society and by the religious elite. He was there uplifting and encouraging and just spending himself, losing himself in ministering to them. And as we lose ourselves in the cares and concerns of those in need, to the extent that we become oblivious of our own doing and lose ourselves in it, all we are demonstrating and what we are coming into a deeper experience of growing love in love with Jesus. You know why? Because Jesus is revealing himself to us through those same ones Amen. that are downtrodden. He reveals himself even through those in need. Spend quality time with him in his word. It's important enough, isn't it? Spend quality time with him in his word, and as he reveals more of himself there in his word. In fact, I tell you something. The more you come to know and to love Jesus, 
the less you will be concerned about your own salvation. Amen. Amen. Understand what I'm saying? Yeah. The more you enter into that love relationship with Jesus, the less you will be intimidated by the destruction and the hell and all the things that you hear coming up in the world which the Bible tells us will indeed happen. And the possibility of, of being lost, that loses. Your concern will not even be for your own salvation. You are spent, you're wrapped up with Him, you're secure with Him, and that becomes a non-issue to your mind. Because you'll be relating with Him, you'll be relating to Him from a different, a completely different paradigm, a completely different mindset. We close in the book of Hosea. Hosea chapter 2, ch chapter 1. Turn to me quickly. Hosea chapter 1. Right after Daniel. Mm -hmm. Hosea chapter 1. You know, God told the prophet Hosea. Hosea, you can just imagine, young man growing up and very sincere, very dedicated, very much given himself to God, to be used by God for the salvation of the world. In whatever, to whatever extent God chooses to use him for the salvation of others, you know. And God says to Hosea, Hosea, I want you to go take up a prostitute, that prostitute, that particular person, and marry her. Just imagine, if that were you, young man. What do you think, Brother Pablo? You're going to be saying, or at least naturally, one would be saying, you know, David, what do you think? But God, I was hoping to find a nice Christian girl. God says, Hosea, hold it. I need to reach my people. In other words, God gave prophecies, but he was making Hosea the prophecy itself. He was using this experience to an object lesson. He said, fine, go to this prostitute and woo her and marry her. Verse 2, Hosea chapter 1. The beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, Go and take unto thee a wife of whoredoms, and the children of whoredoms, for the land has committed great whoredom, departing from the Lord. Yeah. And Hosea went, got this prostitute, wooed her out of her life of prostitution, thinking that he was now settled, happy. He had children with her. He was settled at home. But there was still the the smoldering coals beneath the surface within her that had not been extinguished, right? Mm -hmm. And what did she do? After settling it, he settled into married life, and she's there, he feels happy, okay, at least it worked out. She got up one day and she went back to her life of prostitution. And after she went back into her life of prostitution, who do you think is heartbroken? Hosea is. And he has children with her. And what did God say to Hosea? Hosea, go back and get her back. And because a prostitute has a price, Hosea had to buy her back. Chapter 3 and verse 1. Then said the Lord unto me, Go yet, love a woman beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress. This is when God is telling Hosea to go back and buy her back. He says, according to to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel who look to other gods and love flagons, flagons of wine. Verse 2, so I bought her to me for 15 pieces of silver and for an homer of barley and a an half homer of barley. Hold on. You know what God is saying to us here? Notice what in verse 1 what it says. He said, go and get her back. And he says, according, he said, go back and love her. Get her back. Reach her where she was and express that love and buy her back. And notice how verse 1 ends. According to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel, who themselves are in adultery, who look to other gods. What is God saying? God is saying, Hosea, when you feel heartbroken, when your heart is tearing apart, because of the rejection of someone you love who does not love you. 
tell my people that this is what God feels. That's why he says, according to the love of the Lord for Israel. Yes. And when you go and get her back, and she goes back into it, and you go back and you buy her back, and she goes back into it, and your heart is ripping apart. Tell my people Israel that this is part of what is involved in being God, in being love. I go through the same thing. God is saying the, the heartbreak you go through is a reflection of something in me because the, the creator creates from and gives within that which he creates, it has what? It reflects back on the creator itself, right? The creator himself. Yes. So the, 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 the fact that we naturally desire certain things and things naturally affect us in certain ways it's just a faint glimmer of the fact that the God who created us made us in his image God says Hosea tell my people that this is what God feels towards them love is creative it is designed to create within us an appropriate response, a response of love. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 19 says, we love him because he first loved us. That is the moral dynamic of the gospel. It means love creates love within. And when God has a people who have entered into this kind of a relationship, when God has a people who no longer function from the paradigm of do this, do that, do that, a written code, but they function from the experience of being in love with him, so that obedience now naturally flows from the heart, God says, here is how you'll be relating to me. Your whole mindset will change, and this is how you will, this is what God wants. Go to chapter 2, verse 16. Let's start verse 13. Hosea chapter 2. Start from verse 13. Notice what it says. And I will visit upon her the days of Balaam, wherein she burned incense to them, and she decked herself with her earrings and her jewels, and she went after her lovers. He's speaking about Israel. And forgot me, says the Lord. Therefore, behold, I will allure her. In other words, God is saying, I will attract her. And bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. In other words, notice that God uses the law of attraction. He can use nothing else. You cannot use force. Can you force somebody to love you? No. Not even God could force us to love him. Because then it would not be love. He could not even create us so that we had to love him. You know that? Amen. God could not create, God doesn't want puppets or robots or whatever. He had to give us freedom to choose and love can only exist in the environment of freedom. Amen. So he couldn't create us so that we had to love him. He had to give us the freedom to choose to love him or to reject him. And if we choose to reject him, he comes after us and he seeks to attract us by the revelation of his love for us. You cannot force someone to love you or to feel affection for you. The moment you use force, love dries up. Because these two things, force and love, they occupy two totally different emotional spheres. They are mutually exclusive principles. And thus God uses the principle of attraction. We're told in Desire of Ages, page 22. The exercise of force is contrary to the principles of God's government. Amen. He desires only. He says he desires only the service of what? Love. love. And love cannot be commanded. It cannot be won by force or authority. Only by love is what? Love. love. Awakened. That is the creative power of love. 
it creates a response within. And notice now, when that response is created, when we deserve, discern that love of God and allow it to do its leavening work of breaking the bondage of that kind of a formalism, that kind of checklist, pharisaical kind of religion, and it's allowed to check that away and to break the bondage of that and remove the veil from our eyes and we come into that relationship with him. Notice what God says, and this is what God desires to have with every single one here. Verse 16, Hosea, this is 16. Notice. And it shall be at that day, says the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ish. That's actually how it's pronounced. Ishi or Ish. What does that word mean? Husband. And shall call me no more daily master. God is saying, look, I'm not one looking for that kind of subservient, kind of groveling, kind of, okay, God, I'm going to do this because I'm, God said, no, I've called you into marriage with me, Amen. in which two join together, become one, Amen. knit together in heart. You will no longer call me master, you call me husband. Do we see the degree, the intimacy, the kind of thing that Christianity ought to be? Why do you think tens of thousands after 20, 30 years or whatever or some after a few months leave and go back? Because they haven't seen this. No. They've been introduced to a kind of a checklist kind of a system which only leads to frustration and deeper and deeper frustration until they either give up or choose to commit themselves to grit their teeth, clench their fists, roll up their sleeves and say, I'm going to stick in there even if it kills me. That's torture. He says, no longer will you call me master, you call me husband. For I will take away the names of Baal out of your mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name. And I will betroth thee unto me forever. I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment, and in loving kindness and in mercies. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness. And thou shalt what? No the Lord. That word no, we know many places in scripture where it's used, right? The same word no. What example? And Adam knew his wife and they had a child. God is saying what you see in the physical realm in nature, I want to have the counterpart to that in the spiritual realm of the relationship, your marriage to me. God is saying, just like Adam knew his wife in, the, in, 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 the, in that intimacy and produced the fruit of the womb, he says, I want to know you in that same depth of intimacy so that you may produce the fruit of the Spirit. Amen. 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 So God is seeking a people who are willing to grow up into the maturity of a religion that enters into and joins with him with the bonding union of the same love that exists between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit within the Godhead. He's saying, look, you're invited into this union. You're invited into the circuit of beneficence. Come in. That's what I want. I don't want you to, to even if you come with a do's and don'ts paradigm, God is saying, allow me to change you so that now you will enter into the experience that is the real thing. Lose the first husband. Let John go. Yeah. Yeah. Give yourself to Michael. Yeah. Yeah. Let us pray. Yeah. Loving Heavenly Father, thank you so good. Thank you, Father, for so bringing out your word to our minds and our hearts. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who is here and who has come and has given us understanding. Thank you for everyone that is here, O oh God. Thank you for your manifest presence with us. O oh, Heavenly Father, thank you for Michael, who is indeed Christ, our divine husband. Lord, we thank you that you have so given us yourself in him for an everlasting companion, a relationship, a union of bonding together in love. 
which will last throughout eternity, but which begins even now. Thank you, Father. In the blessed name of our Savior and our divine husband, we pray. Amen. Let the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord of our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. This has been a presentation of Truth for the Final Generation. For more information on free DVDs, CDs, ebooks, and books, you may call us at 954 478 4673. Or you can email us at tffgflorida at gmail.com. You may also visit our website at tffgflorida.org where you'll see other links to our YouTube and Facebook pages. Thank you and may God continue to bless you.